and he's going to have it. He does. Ricky Henderson. No time. He is fully back. Two was one of those years where it could have went either way. We lost it the seventh game and Bobby Richardson cut the ball off Willie McCovey. I was saying to myself, I wish I could switch. I wish I could switch. With the team we had then, I thought we'd win the National League pennant for the next 10 years. And, uh, the stick was rocking. Yeah, everybody was jumping up and down. SSDs, we're gonna beat the Oakland A's four straight. An earthquake hit and all hell broke loose. Hey, uh, somebody's trying to shake us up. All right, Lord, I heard you. You can't pull nature, you know what I mean? Nature has its own way of doing things. If we played it a different series, we might have beat them. Who knows? I've finally gotten there. Haven't won. In 2002, the city hadn't seen a championship ever. And we were right on the cusp of getting it. We're six game. We should have won that six game. And to lose that game the way we did. I feel like a loser today. I thought it was crushed the whole city. I, I was crushing myself. In a perfect world, we'd be holding the trophy. We're not. And that's the one thing in my career I wish I could go back and change. I said, I've been a bridesmaid three times, no bride. You got to win if you want to be a world champion, and we didn't win. Ultimately, that's that's the goal, you know, day one spring training. You want to make the playoffs, and more than that, you want to win a World Series. We talk about it, uh, you know, we uh, had just come off a pretty good year the year before. We got a taste of it, but not quite the whole meal. We're going to be good. Uh, we, we're going to compete. The players had high expectations. They were buoyed by last year's success and uh, they knew because of the pitching we really had a chance to win the division. We went in thinking that it could be a good season, but thinking it and making it happen are two different things. As we broke camp, as we came out of spring training, I think that the guys were starting to get real comfortable with not only the positions that they were playing, but also just the team element. Comfort quickly bred camaraderie. Individual bricks brought together to form an impenetrable wall. You sensed early on that, uh, that this was a close group. We always supporting each other and we like we we a family. It was like the United Nations in there. Characters galore, but they all came to the park early. They got their work done. They cared about each other. They hung out with each other in the clubhouse. There were no clicks. And the Giants win it here in the 13th inning. It was the best club that ever got along great as a team. They stuck together, they hung around together, and they did things together. However, for all the clubhouse continuity in the world, the Giants couldn't solve their most confounding riddle, the National League West rival, San Diego Padres. They could not beat the Padres, especially in San Diego. There were so many times where we would go on a streak and we would win, and they would win. So you're just sitting there constantly going, you gotta be kidding me, these guys are never gonna lose. You look up every day, it was one nothing, two to one, one nothing, two to one. My gosh, these guys give up runs. Every time we do something right, you know, they do something right, so. Um, you know, we went through that frustrating part and we just kept saying, hey, let's just keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing. The push would add some power soon enough. On July 1st, the G-Men would part ways with veteran catcher Benji Molina, opening the door for a star in the making. We knew that at some point Buster was going to be ready. Out to right field. This one is hit pretty well and out of here. Buster Posey goes to the opposite field, and it's 4-3. to three. At that time, we're behind San Diego, so it was probably time to make a move, a change. It was time to do something to help get us back in first place. I didn't see it coming. It's kind of mixed emotions. It's uh, sad to see a guy like that go, a uh, great clubhouse guy, but at the same time, was excited for the opportunity I had to, to step in and, and be the starting catcher. I think the pitchers had developed enough to know that if they were going to lose the guy that they'd thrown most of their innings to. They were still going to be OK. You know, and it was time to turn the page. We're halfway through the season almost, and you're going to have to step in and catch these powerful 
somewhat violent arms that we have. Fortunately, it was a pretty smooth transition. I had somebody like Buster Posey stepping in who was a complete student of the game. You know, it took a while for us to kind of get on the same page, but when we did it, it was extremely comfortable. Buster's had some interesting insight. Uh, he thinks one of the reasons the pitchers gravitated towards him, they were all pretty much his age, and, you know, there wasn't a gap in, in communication. Matt Kane and I talked, and I said, what's your game plan going in, you know, facing guys? He says, I'm, you know, I'm throwing whatever Buster calls. He did a good job of just stepping in real quick and, and getting it. So it really didn't take very long at all for any of us. The way Buster came in. And they got him. Oh, my word. And literally grabbed the bull by the horns. I mean, he grabbed the reins of this whole pitching staff and said, I'm here. You know what I'm saying? He goes, trust me. And that's all he did. He said, trust me. He lived up to his expectation and his reputation. It's tough for a kid to do, especially, you know, hit the way he did and catch the staff that he did. I looked at it as, as the opportunity to contribute. It wasn't all on my shoulders. It was uh, different guys as, that we saw stepped up throughout the entire course of the season. While Posey flourished behind the dish and at the plate, general manager Brian Sabian wasn't done adding to his burgeoning masterpiece. The late season acquisitions that you get can sort of give a team an emotional lift, also, you know, a lift on the field. And, uh, you know, the acquisition of Cody Ross and Pat Burrow did that immediately. But as soon as Pat got here, he had a whale of a month where he basically carried the offense. Burrow was really lucky to draw him getting released, and he was sitting out there and wanted to be a giant. He would come off the bench. Uh, at first to be able to get that big pinch hit or that big, big at bat. And we were all looking for Pat to be that guy. Welcome to San Francisco, Pat Burrell. And that's what he was, and he got so good at doing that and so hot that they couldn't help but play him. High drive! Left field! Out of here! Off the foul pole, a grand slam for Pat Burrell! As we went forward, you, you know, the Rod Steele was kind of quirky also. In our minds, we were looking for somebody that was more versatile in the outfield to play both sides of the ball. We needed somebody else that uh, uh, could be feared. Cody Ross added energy, the ability to play all three outfield positions, and kind of like the attitude where, you know what, I'm going to swing, and if I hit it, it's going to go. I was really happy because I was coming to a, a team that was contending and a very good ball club. People ask me, you know, did you expect to be where you're at, um, you know, when you got claimed? And I say, yeah, because I truly believed in our pitching staff that they could carry us all the way through. I mean, that's how good they are. I've had to face these guys, and it's not fun. We saw that we had strong pitching, obviously, but maybe we need some bullpen help. All the guys in here pretty welcoming right when I walked in and introduced themselves and just told me basically just let's get after it. Lopez we'd seen a lot of. He had a good reputation for being able to get the big O. And that'll do it. And also not being just situational, pitching more to one hitter, and uh, he really saved us. In a lot of ways, you can say, I don't know if the Giants win it if, if Lopez is not on the team. You know, almost every guy that Brian Sabian picked up made a contribution. Even when we got, like, Fontenot just walked across the diamond. I mean, it was incredible the way they came in and just said, hey, we're here with the same approach and the same idea as you guys. We want the same goal. We just want to win. It was an interesting team this year. Like, a lot of second chance guys, a lot of cast offs, and all thrown together in one line with a, with a super rookie in the middle. The complimentary pieces appeared set for the stretch run, just as the centerpiece of the organization began to falter. In all the years I've been around, I've never seen a region struggle with Lincecum struggling. People just didn't know how to deal with it. People would ask me, what the heck is wrong with Lincecum? You know, they were like mad at him. They loved him, but they were mad at him. Blasts one deep to right field, and that one is wet. Ultimately, it's Tim. You know, it's going to come down to him. You can say, I can say whatever. Rise can say whatever. Bose can say whatever. But he's the one that's going to take charge with, with what he does. And he did a great job with that. It's a matter of just, you know, stop thinking about the doubters, stop thinking about your own doubt in yourself, and, you know, just get back to yourself and doing what you know how to do and uh, stop thinking so much. I mean, that was, that's, I think that can be one of the painful things in baseball is you know, over a long season, you know, you get into August and you know, when the season's not going so well, and obviously we were kind of slumping during that time. His mechanics were screwed up. It was not allowing him to, to do the things he's been capable of doing throughout his career. So it was, it was an emotional hit. In August, you know, it, it totally spiraled. I mean, August, the mind started to leave. You know, he started losing his confidence. It's a number of things, just not, you know, just getting in your own head and, uh, I don't know. 
I really don't want to explain it. And then all of a sudden you start to see him come out a little bit. You have one good pitch, four bad ones, and then he'd have two good pitches, three bad ones, three good ones, two bad ones. And by the end of the month, you could sense that he was close. All the success he's had and all the great performances he's had, you know, you have to remember this guy's never had failure at the big league level. So for him to go through that in August, for me, was a great thing because it's a great learning experience to take into the future. That wasn't an easy month for him and for him to come back and have the September he had and, and then do what he did in the playoffs speaks a lot for the, the mental toughness he has. I don't think there was anybody in that clubhouse that felt very confident that the Giants could go all the way without Tim Lincecum. I have a stressful day, I can get on BART and just tune out and relax. Get to, you know, sit and get your head together for a couple minutes, play some games on your phone. I usually listen to music, maybe read a magazine or two. I stare at my screen like everybody else. Sleep or listen to music. Text safely, read a book. You know, pop open my laptop, get some work done. Check my email, check my Facebook, and then I'm there. It's early in the morning, I'm going to work, trying to catch a couple of uh, Z's. <laughs> sometimes I read, sometimes I rest my eyes, and sometimes, you know, just look out the window. Fart you there. If you're being audited by the IRS or state, you may not know you have a serious problem. Auditors are more relentless than ever in demanding taxes that often you don't really owe. You need a tax attorney who's aggressive, accessible, and most of all, experienced. I'm tax attorney Steve Moskowitz. Our team of tax attorneys and CPAs have been resolving tax problems for over 30 years. Call Moskowitz LLP, a tax law firm, at 888-TAX-STEAL. At Eric's Deli Cafe, taste starts with quality. We only use the best ingredients, and our bread is baked fresh daily. Our produce is farm fresh, and our family recipe soups and signature Texas Jailhouse chili. Well, sons of Eric's, I see an army of gherkins here in defiance of tyranny. We're in hot water, Davy. Yup. <laughs> Adrian Gonzalez got on first base at our place. It had to be a month left in the season. He says to me, you know what's going to happen? It's going to come down to us here, final game, final weekend, you watch. I'm like, oh, God, I hope not. Alas, for the 2010 Giants, the path of least resistance was truly the road less traveled. San Francisco entered September trailing the division leading Padres by four games. A shot at the postseason and history still very much within reach. It's in the left field! And the Giants take the lead! Did we think we could catch him? Oh, of course. Oh, we had them in our sights the whole year. They weren't striking misses, and that's all we wanted to be. We were right there, you know, hopefully come pretty close with San Diego, and, you know, as they started to slip, we, uh, you know, we'd turn up the years. The Giants moving into first place for the first time in nearly four and a half months. September baseball is absolutely great if if you're in the hunt and it also helps that the team in front of you loses 10 straight uh, and that's what the Padres did that last month is uh, pretty nerve-wracking not only are you going out there on the field and you know doing your thing and, and trying to play the best ball game possible but at the same time you sort of peeking in the scoreboard watching we watched every single game you're trying to win every single game and hoping that they're losing so you can get back in it and get back in it they did the revitalized ace leading the charge, eager to reestablish his dominance. Oh, he strikes him out swinging. And said notice that he was back for good. When Lincecum came back and started to throw the ball like he could, then I knew that they had a pretty good shot at getting into October. I think it was when we did go down to San Diego, we had the four-game series against them, and I started throwing my slider. We got a team that's, uh, you know, rolling right now uh, behind me, you know, scoring runs, so... You know, like I said, you got to take advantage of that, and you know the confidence is is is, is at a all time high right now. That was a turning point for me, just because uh, you know it gave me something, a little bit of confidence to be able to throw strikes. Once you get it back as an athlete, the confidence you lost, you get it back like that, and everybody in that clubhouse picked up on it. It's like, mm-hmm, he's back. You're in a pennant race, and that's what the game's about. Uh, is there pressure? Sure, a little bit. And probably some stress, but at the same time, that's why you play the game. So we play a lot of exciting series. Base hit. Burrow's got to go a long way to get it. Burrow's twisting around. They're going to send Gonzalez home. Arriba's relay is high. The Rockies win. When you're September, you understand how important every pitch is. 
Every play is, every at bat, and uh, these guys uh, did it. I don't tip my cap. They beat us. That's fine. We're one on one in the series right now. Tomorrow is the deciding factor. They played a good baseball game. That's fine. We're going to come back tomorrow and we're going to play another baseball game. It wasn't so much pressure. We would get, you know, if we lost, we would thought we were done. Um, but hey, we've, we're going to go out there and, and play every, every game, every inning like it's, you know, we've got to win. And we wanted to win every inning. I don't know how many times, either before a series or before a game, that we'd say, this is the biggest series of the year, or this is the biggest game. But as they made each step and they gained more and more success, they gained more confidence. Got him! Confidence bred confidence within the clubhouse and between the white lines. This is going to be a great plane ride heading back to San Francisco. Thanks in large part to the man they call Boach, pulling all the right strings at all the right times. He keeps everybody in check, and the hardest part is managing personalities, managing the clubhouse, not the game. And that's where Bochy has outdone himself. He's a great player's manager. He stays with his boys. He, he believes in his boys. Uh, he doesn't give up on you too fast. He understands the game. He understands there's ups and downs and struggles. He's got a tremendous ability behind closed doors to uh, explain it in the right way, in a professional way, in a personal way that everybody can understand their role. He's been a lot to us. They, he's a great manager, great person, uh, treat us with a lot of respect. And he, oh, he wants to us play hard, and uh, that's what we did for him. That maximum effort led the Giants to the brink of the playoffs, just one victory away from a National League West crown. But consecutive losses on Friday and Saturday. Don't come out here and argue balls and strikes! set the stage for a Sunday showdown in the friendly confines of AT&T Park. 161 games after it all began. There was a scenario if we lose that game, we've got to play a playoff game down in San Diego. The last thing we wanted the club uh, to have in the back of their mind, uh, hey, we can lose this game, we got to get ready to go to San Diego. So when I address the club, I just wanted to have the mentality, hey, we're burning the bridge here. We, we, we're not bringing our luggage tomorrow, we're going to win it tomorrow and take care of business. He said, no one pack your bag. He goes, I ain't packing my bag. And no one packed their bags. No one. In a way that, that the pressure was more on those guys than it was on us. But we were more than ready to have it done with. Sure, we had a little hiccup here, but uh, hopefully uh, Johnny goes out there and uh, just gives us a chance. The one thing about Jonathan is, you know, if he's got his stuff, He's really tough to beat. And as usual, he go out there and play a nail biter. Sanchez knocks it down. He will recover and throw, and they got him. It was bottom of the eighth, and we're up 2 nothing. And Posey hits a homer and puts up 3 nothing. High drive. Left field. It is out of here. And right then, Wilson was down there popping the mid, and I'm in the dugout. My heart's racing 1,000 miles an hour. The crowd's going crazy. And I'm sitting there thinking about my whole career down to this moment. The Giants are champions in the National League West. And let the party begin. Never felt an emotion like that when that final out was made, just to finally get in after all those years for me. Ten seasons, ten long seasons of futility, ten painful seasons of hopes dashed and dreams crushed, ten fruitless seasons gone, just like that. In the blink of an eye, a career validated with two simple words, division champion. Just a magical year for me and, and for this team. I think everybody understood what it meant to him. The crowd's going crazy, so I go down just to get out of the crowd noise and shut the bathroom door and sit down for a second. And just kind of and went back out there. Here's a guy for nine years in his career was watching Boston, New York go right by him. And it hurts. It hurts when you're a good player and you are not on a good team. And uh, it's not something you can openly talk about it, but it's something that gnaws on you like a beaver on a pine tree. It's just, it's brutal. To be able to do this, it's made all those years worth it. From day one, I felt very comfortable there. I felt, even after we broke Cam, how special this team could be. We had a real good group of guys to start the season off of. Some of the best guys I've ever broke camp with before in my life. And, uh, you know, to this day, I don't think I'll ever play the better group of guys in my life. Yeah! Yeah! To be able to go out there and finally celebrate at the end of the year, the last game of the year, jumping on the field, running around the field. I've never been so tired from running one lap around the field in my entire life. 
a lot of the hard work paid off kind of thing. And then, you know, obviously you worry about the playoffs, but, you know, you get to soak it up. You know, it was a long season. It was a big grind. You know, we had our ups and downs. You know, individuals did. We made moves. We got new guys. We just had the right guys at the right time. You want to get there and you want to experience that. And then once uh, we did, it's like a, you know, pressure off your shoulders because you could always say that you went to the playoffs and that you've experienced it. There's a lot of guys that never get to that opportunity. It's relief. I think everybody wanted it so bad. And to know that it's my first season, I've, I've got an opportunity to play in the playoffs. What's really fun is, is watching just the guys before everybody else comes in. And then it gives you an idea of how close this team was. A lot of hugging, a lot of champagne, obviously. But, you know, a lot of guys just looking into the other guy's eyes and saying, you know what, we did it. I, I, we did it. Now you got to reset your sights, reset your goals. Uh, you know, look, we, we got to where we needed to be in the playoffs. Now we got to figure out a way to get to the next level in the playoffs. You hear people talking about it all the time. Oh, man, you, you know, when you get to the playoffs, it's, uh, it's nothing like, you know, that atmosphere. Every single pitch counts. I just wanted to be able to have that opportunity to feel that. With an eight-month journey now in the rearview mirror, the National League West champions are faced with a new challenge, this time with far less room for error. Yeah, I can honestly say I'm really not nervous. I'm excited. I was a little more nervous for that game than any other game that I've been in just because it was the playoff atmosphere. You know it's at stake, and it's tough when you start one of those five-game series where the first game is probably the biggest. Timmy came through. He really just went right after Atlanta and, and went out there and threw great. I don't know that any of us really realize what he did. He probably doesn't either, but I mean, a two-hit shutout, you gotta be kidding me against that lineup. And just watching once to come do what he was doing, we all knew that if we could just push one run across, it, it could be, you know, the difference. It's strike three, Cole. He strikes him out to end the ball game. I know after that start, I, I think the team realized that we have the pitching that, that can do this for us, and uh, we got off to a great start there with, with Timmy's uh, effort, and certainly did a lot for the confidence uh, of the club, but hey, we're just not here. You know, we're here to win this thing. If Tim Lincecum's dominant game one start offered reason for confidence, a fast start in game two only bolstered dreams of bigger things on the horizon. Burl hits the home run, it's three nothing. And you're thinking, all right, here we go, right? This, you know, a laugher is, is four nothing win. And they come back and the Braves beat him is hit deep to right field way back there and this one is headed for McCovey Cole. That's a tough loss no getting around it but you have to bounce back. It was a big blow. I was like man I don't know if we're going to be able to recover from that. But I knew a personality of our team that we would bounce back. We didn't feel like we had any more pressure on us than any other time. It was almost back to square one. It was one to one uh, in the series so it was, now it's a three game series in our mind. And that was the whole season right there that third game. I mean, being down right there in the ninth inning and battling back. Those fans are, are going crazy. Bobby Cox's last season and go down two to one in the ninth. And they got their little chop going. <laughs> and that's loud. We were down, I think, the last pitch of the game and Aubrey gets a huge base hit. One batter later, with a two to one series deficit just one strike away, a sharply hit Buster Posey ground ball would skid under brave second baseman Brooks Conrad's glove. I've never seen a guy have a series like this. This is an absolute nightmare for Brooks Conrad. The living embodiment of agony and ecstasy on display for all to see. Right then, I just knew that this was, it was meant to be. Maybe at some point this franchise needed to have a little luck. Uh, and you know, and, and you know, I felt bad for Brooks Conrad. So absolutely terrible right now. I wish I could just, uh, you know, dig a hole and go sleep in there. I gave up a home run to Erkinski that night. It broke my heart. I thought I ruined it for everybody. It, it was just an unbelievable low for me. And the way they picked me up, they allowed me to forget about that. Every one of them, each one of them came up to me after the game and was like, we care about you, you're part of this, believe it. To them, it was a proving ground. The Atlanta Braves series, they were the favorite. And the Braves played their tails off. Now they get to Philadelphia. They were hardened by what happened in, in Atlanta. They were hardened mentally. They were ready for the for the Phillies. Our work's not done though. Uh, you know, we, we still got to win some more games, and the goals to goals to win a World Series. Reaching that goal would be easier said than done. The two-time defending National League champion Phillies loomed large over Major League Baseball. 
a fact not lost on the lower profile giants. We noticed that there's a lot of, uh, I'd say, East Coast bias. I think our mentality was, hey, let's shock the world. That motivated us a lot. We heard a lot from the media that it was their series and they're going to win and it's all about them. We embraced it. We loved it. We loved the fact that nobody was giving us the opportunity. On paper, they have an amazing pitching staff, a good bullpen, and a pretty dynamic offense. But they can be pitched to. Everybody can be pitched to. I don't care who's on the mound, right? I got to go out there and try to get hits. Um, whether it be Lynchcomb, whether it be Kane, whether it be Sanchez. They got so many weapons. We respected that ball club. We did and we knew that we could play with that ball club. I think it really helps to go up against the big dog if you've got Lincecum starting the first game. And of course, they had Holiday starting the first game. But once you beat him... You know that if you're gonna go up against a guy like that, that he's probably not gonna give up a lot of runs. You know, he's gonna give his team a chance to win, which he always pretty much does. The players, they understand that we have good pitching, and that's how you beat good pitching. Now, we went in those games, we knew that they would pitch well, but our guys are going to pitch well, too. Let's just figure a way to get enough runs. Bruce Bochy asked, and he was not disappointed. Ross, it's a drive to left. Hit very well. It is way back. Out of here. Cody Ross has done it again, and the Giants take the lead. Cody Ross entered the national spotlight with a splash. Twice, despite an uncertain spot in the Giants lineup, just days before his game one coming out party. When Bochy came up to me and, uh, a couple days before and said, you're gonna be you know, my starting right fielder, I was so excited, you know, I couldn't hold it in. I wanted, you know, just I wanted to cry. <laughs> I had a couple friends from the Marlins that told me, you know, when he gets hot, he, he stays hot for a while and he can carry it, watching him batting practice uh, and the confidence that uh, he was playing with. I, I wasn't surprised that he kept it going. For whatever reason, Cody Ross got hot at the right time. At Roy Holiday twice for crying out loud. And what he did, and like I said, he's a streaky homer hitter, and he just caught that streak at the right time. You know, everything was going so fast. I really didn't know what was you know, going on. It was so surreal. I just thought, you know, just a couple home runs, you know, in the game. You know, no big deal. I've done it before. But then, you know, everyone's talking about how it's Roy Holiday. Cody Ross backwards and sorry, Doc. I'll let it be that. It was his time, apparently, you know, and, and it was a pleasure and a privilege for me to watch that. And I was very glad he was on my side. You just beat one of the best pitchers in, you know, all of baseball at his home for the first game, and which is the first game is the biggest one of them all. At that point, we knew that we were capable of doing it. A Herculean task easier said than done. The Giants dropped game two in Philadelphia six to one before traveling west. A championship hungry public ready to celebrate on home turf. I've never seen anything like it. The fans were like I've never seen before, just going crazy. And just the support that they were giving us was incredible. We felt real confident coming back here to play three games in a row against Philly in our stadium, knowing that they hate playing here. I really just wanted to go out there and get that homestand and start it out right. Timmy's our ace, but he's our horse, and uh, he gave us some amazing starts. And he looks like he's that type of guy that has the it stuff in, in the postseason where he would be that guy that can just take over a game. I thought game was too good. He didn't, he didn't give us any runs. Charlie Manuel's Phillies were battered but not beaten after falling 6-5 to five in game four. Here comes Aubrey Huff. This game is over. Philadelphia managed to stave off elimination in game five, sending the three games to two series back to the city of brotherly love, but not before issuing a warning to the upstart Giants. We're a focused bunch, and we got uh, we got some professional guys in there and some really good players, and, um, you know, we, we still know what we're doing. They won the fifth game. Once they felt they got back to Philadelphia, they thought, game on, we got this back. This is us. We're in. We're going to win. Game six was an 8 o'clock start. It was the longest day of my life. Back your mind, you don't want to think it, but it's there, and you don't want to lose game six. If you lose game six, game seven is going to be really, really extremely tough to win, especially with the momentum shift and being in Philly. You know, we talk about this clubhouse, the strength that they had, they were close knit, and they had to be, because when you went into the Philadelphia Phillies, you were playing a lot of intimidation. In that ballpark, with that offense, with that crowd. I've been in that situation before. I play San Diego, play Atlanta. I mean, they're a postseason game, so it's going to be the same. It was evident to me that Johnny was not on top of his game. He was struggling with his uh, command. His velocity was down a little bit. I was hoping after a second inning that he would find it, but uh, it was, again, evident in the third inning he was off. 
Then when he hit Utley, I was heading out to take him out. Then the incident happened where the benches cleared. Utley and Sanchez now are barking at each other, and here comes both teams. I'm sure it was frustration on Sanchez's part, frustration on Chase's part. And I think probably just tension was high. Fans are going nuts. It's game six of the NLCS, and that's what happens sometimes. There was so much meaning for that game, but even more now because of what happened. You know, the benches clearing and spatting going on, and just crazy. For Raphael to come in after that and go first and second and no out, and there's another turning point in the playoffs. I mean, that's that's the one of the key moments in that series. We talked about all those scenarios before the game, believe it or not, in, in Bruce's office. For some reason, this game goes upside down early. Who are we going to use? And I can tell you sincerely, for some weird reason, it played out that way. We were going to use Raphael and Baumgartner as a bridge to get to the end of the game. And oh, by the way, if we had a lead, Timmy was going to be the eighth inning guy with Wilson warm enough to get a save or win the game. Juan Uribe stepped to the plate in the top of the eighth inning. With two down and the base is empty. One swing away from silencing 46,000 rabid Philadelphians. Swing and a high fly ball to right field deep. Going back is worth. Still going back at the warning track. At the wall. Adios. Pelota. Juan Uribe has hit an opposite field home run in the eighth inning. And the Giants have gone ahead three to two. You look at the way that he plays and the way he hits you. There's no finesse in his game. He would go times where there would be some droughts. But it always seemed that if there was a big hit that they needed, you know, he could get it. And they looked at him to get it, and he wanted to be the guy that didn't get it for him. No, I'm not looking for pitch. You know, I'm not looking for pitch. I have like a big swing, see the ball, I have a big swing. You know, I try a big swing every time. With that shot, Uribe's first of the postseason, the reigning two-time Cy Young winner took the mound in relief two days after pitching seven innings in a Game 5 loss. Timmy's our guy, and for him to, to say, all right, give me the ball, that's a signal to everybody else. I'm sure he didn't feel good. I'm sure his arm was, was heavy, and, uh, but he came in, and he came in and, and, and stepped up and probably didn't get the job done like he wanted to, but it didn't matter. We all felt really, really confident. Timmy's been, always been that guy that's not afraid to take the ball, and he did a good job. If they needed me, you know, I made myself available, and then they told me to go out there, and so I did. And after that, you know, the bullpen, the real bullpen, you know, came in and saved my butt. Brian Wilson in one of those moments that players dream about. I don't know if I've ever been more nervous in my life. <laughs> it was incredible. That pitch that he threw Ryan Howard to end the series was probably one of the best pitches I've ever seen. I think it was 3-2, like a storybook type ending, and you know, one of the best power hitters in the game. Um, you know, to be able to throw an exact perfect pitch at that particular time was, I mean, I've never seen anything like that. The pitch. Strike three, Cone! A cutter on the outside corner at the knees. The ball game is over, and the Giants have won the National League pennant. When Ryan Howard struck out, I took my binoculars and I looked in the Phillies' dugout, and it was almost like, this is it? Come on, we're going to play tomorrow, right? It's over? Brian Wilson's fifth save of the postseason brought a fourth National League pennant to San Francisco and ensured a third October champagne celebration in the Giants clubhouse. I like it. I don't even like champagne, but I do now. It came down to that three and two pitch, and he said, you know what? He says, I got to throw a strike, whether it's right down the middle or not. He says, if he hits it out, we got another game tomorrow. And with that kind of mentality, it just tells you that uh, he's got a lot of courage. Well, it's fitting that he should finish them all, really, uh, just because of what he did. And he may very well have been the MVP of September in postseason. He never cries about it, he never bitches about it, he just goes out and does it. Wilson would see action in another clinching game just nine days later. But first, there was the matter of celebrating the long and often arduous journey to the Fall Classic. It's gonna get weird tonight. That had to be the highest uh, intensity level game I've, I've ever played really and get that last out and know that we're going to the World Series um, was unbelievable. I think we all took that mentality of hey let's have fun for about a couple hours real quick do our thing and then let's get ready to go because um, we've got a great chance of, of winning all of this. We were uh, elated with it obviously it was exciting you know but we knew that we had another, another step we wanted to enjoy this right now you know and at the same time we were just kind of you know I wouldn't say in awe, but it's like this, you know, it's kind of one of those things, this just happened. It's kind of surreal just to make it that far. We're going to the ship! We're going to the ship! We're going to the ship! 
further and further you get um, into the playoffs, the better the celebration gets. But you never can really just let loose and let it all out because you know you still have business to take care of. We enjoyed it. We savored it that night. Flew back the uh, next day, but you know, now your work begins. I've been to the World Series, but I lost the World Series, and I know how hard it is to get there. So, you know, work uh, started right away. You're always uh, picturing yourself or having this vision of being in the World Series. And uh, then as you get older, you re realize how big uh, this stage is. We beat the Phillies. They beat the Yankees. These are two good teams. They think they can win, but oh, by the way, we think we can win. It's the Giants and Rangers in the 106th World Series. And what a night it's going to be here at the ballpark. Every time I ran out to that line for introductions every series, I got less and less nervous. And I thought to myself, how can this series be any more pressure field than the last one against Philly? Game one, we're facing one of the best ever in postseason. And we got our hands full, but we got a guy on our side that's good, too. Obviously, you're aware of the bats that they have in their lineup and the way they can hurt you. People say we have the pitcher's part, so we try to play to that advantage. You know, you never want to steer clear of your game. Obviously, I don't think either of us had the game of starters that we wanted to. But at the same time, we came out on top again. So, uh, you know, you take every W as it comes, no matter how it comes. In a rebound! I didn't expect that, but pitchers have off days, and uh, he did have uh, an off day that day and made some mistakes. But what was important is we took advantage of it and, uh, and knocked them out there. It didn't matter who was out there. I mean, Cy Young could have been out there, and we're trying to, you know, just go out there and win. If you look at game two, that was a close game. Wilson threw the ball very well. Then he had to come out of the game. Then we benefited uh, from some walks. But, uh, you know, he did what we thought. You look at the score now, you go, oh, that's, you know, that was a rocking chair win. Believe me, it wasn't. It was tight. We knew it was going to be a tough battle. And I just wanted to go out there and keep putting up zeros or keep the game as close as possible to where you know, I gave our guys a good chance at winning. And they were able to take advantage of and, and get a ton of runs. If you're a hitter, and you know the guy has three to strike and the bases are loaded. If you put it in play, it's, it gets ugly. The home field advantage to me, it's tricky. It's kind of how in Philly when we won game one and then you feel like it's a victory when you get out of there winning one game. So to win those two games, we were able to leave and kind of realize that, all right, we did our job here, but now it's time to go to Texas and, and get to work there. We had to win a series. I mean, we didn't want to be in a position that, that we're up two to nothing. We go down there, lose the series, and then all of a sudden you're down three to two with the pressure of having to win game six or game seven. Once we got two nothing, we're heading there a place. We had a pretty good feel about uh, maybe getting this thing might happen for us this year. And they win game three, and Man, oh boy. All right, no big deal. Let's beat them tomorrow, we'll be up to run. You know, the momentum, obviously, uh, we're still down one game, but, you know, it's, it's shifted. I mean, we're, we're at home. Uh, we got the fans behind us. Um, we're right where we want to be. Game four, we felt, was the most important game. And I think the players felt it, too. We go 3-1 or we go 2-2 facing Lee the next day. And Lee and Timmy, you've got two great pitchers. That could be a coin flip. But we had the right guy. Here comes a 21-year-old snot nose that they don't really have a lot of respect for. And Madison Bumgarner reached down their throat, and he yanked out their heart right through their mouth. I've had a chance to catch him for the past couple of years. and. I mean, I guess I expected it out of him, but he's just so even keel, and not a lot bothers him. It's almost unexplainable. He loves that opportunity to be able to take the ball in that big key situation. He showed that in Philly, and he showed that extremely well in, in, in Texas, and uh, I think that's going to be something that we're going to see a lot out of him. Extremely impressive. Even for me, I put myself in there, and I'm like, God, how would I handle this? And I got five years on the guy, you know, and he comes in and just acts like a, a vet, like he's been there and done that before. Madison Bumgarner's Game 4 performance pushed the Giants to the brink, but it would be up to Lincecum to put the final nail in the Rangers' coffin and bring a championship to San Francisco. All of them are, you know, are feeling a, a little something. You know, weather's butterflies, but you have to uh, remind yourself just because you're on a verge of something, uh, you haven't done anything. There's a little bit of nervousness, but I, I try to just be myself. I mean, you know, just having fun before the game, treat it like any other game. Obviously, you can feel butterflies every once in a while, but you try to, you know, push those down. You got the plastics up there. It's just wrapped all the way up to the top, and 
you know, you, you know it's there. It's, now it's there for the taking. Everybody wanted to nail it down there and then to show, you know, we're not here to mess around. We're not going to roll over like everybody else in the country thought we were going to do. With each pitcher we stared down and with each opponent kind of put aside, I think you realized that we were going to be the last team standing, uh, whatever it took. And that was a great pitching battle. Lensigam throws. Cruz swings and misses. Strike three. Tim Lensigam with some dominant stuff. Until Edgar reared his head. Renteria, it's a high drive. Deep left center field. David Murphy going back. He's on the warning track. It is gone! Edgar Renteria has hit a three-run homer against Cliff Lee. We felt good with Edgar up there because he's already shown he has a knack of getting a big hit and came through for it. This guy's a tremendous human being, as loved as anybody in the clubhouse. Didn't have good health the last couple of years, but stayed ready, stayed professional. Boach communicated with him in a way that I think was very respectful and gracious, and he appreciated it. And I think being such a big part of the uh, Philadelphia series actually got him ready to put himself in a position to, to help us in the World Series. I can't say enough about, uh, you know, how well our players, you know, set aside their own ego or agenda and ask what's best for the club, and that's what they did, and really went easier than uh, you would think uh, because they were so professional. And they had one thing in mind, and that was to get a postseason and win the World Series, and and that's the only way it gets done. There was no complaining and no griping. It was uh, it was all about the team, and you don't find that very often. It was everybody. I mean, it's something you can identify with. Um, everybody making a contribution and. And, uh, I mean, it wouldn't have worked any other way. While Renteria's three-run shot would provide the offense, nine outs stood between the Giants and baseball immortality. I'm thinking we did it, and I'm just yelling in the dugout, let's keep it going, guys, let's, let's stay locked in, you know, but in my mind, I'm thinking we just won. The last three outs are the toughest. Timmy had a pretty good eighth inning, but I, I thought he was close. And, uh, you know, talking to, to Dave Rigetti and, and even Buster Posey for a second, I, I knew that Brian Wilson was coming in. You get Cruz up there, and I think it's 3 1 at the time, and there's two outs, and Wilson's on the mound, and nobody's on. He just didn't want Wilson to make it this one of these exciting saves he usually does. And he didn't, man. He went, uh, he went right after Cruz and, and got him. Swing and a miss! And that's it! Giants, for the first time in 52 years, the Giants are world champions. It was sheer excitement. Where do we go? What do we do? Who am I going to run into? Who am I going to tackle? Hope nobody gets hurt. It was so emotional just to be able to look down on the field and see these grown men, 25 to 35 year old men, out there acting like little five year olds, jumping around like, you know, they just ran into a big pot of candy. You know, it was unbelievable. I mean, what can you say? It's every kid's dream growing up. I mean, you probably reenacted in your backyard with siblings and friends and last out of the World Series. It's dreamlike, it really is. And I, I still probably will my whole life just get chills watching that last out and seeing the emotion of of the guys uh, coming off the bench, and, and it, was, it was awesome. We head out to the field, and so many emotions are running through your mind. You just see the reaction. You know, the crowd, obviously, we're in Texas, and, you know, they're in awe. You know, they're probably thinking, like, how did this happen to us? And I'm sure we shocked a lot more other people, too, but, you know, to have the orange and black there in Texas. We had plenty of fans there just to share that with. You know, you see the emotion come across their face. Finally got a chance to breathe after the uh, trophy presentation and went in my office and just thought about all the people who helped me, my dad. Uh, there's so many thoughts going through your, your head at that point. You realize what it takes, why you do it. It is about the journey. And this team deserved this because it was literally a special place in time. It's something I can't describe, but stand up there and realize that we just won the World Series. There's so many things you're thinking about up there, but realize we did it. We finally did it. It's been the guy all year, Rex. <laughs> Looking back after it's, it's all done now, there's still mornings I wake up and kind of just laugh to myself and, and think that, you know, we're World Series champions. I mean, it's, it's still, it's unbelievable. The San Diego Padres, the Atlanta Braves, the Philadelphia Phillies, 
the Texas Rangers, they are all out of here. most exciting time throughout it all, the parade. I've never seen anything so incredible. I knew there was gonna be a lot of people. I knew it was gonna be a special experience, but for almost two straight hours of just people screaming and going crazy and horns blowing and, I mean, I was deaf after. I've never been in something so loud before in my life. It was like they were testing a bunch of subwoofers and just turning them up as loud as possible in between those buildings. It was by far one of the coolest things ever. This was endless, it was like a river of people, a river of orange and black. And to see that, you know, you see the fans and how much they care, you see the community and how much it uplifted them. And so you see, you know, really what, it, what it's about and what went into it and how many years we have gone into finally winning this thing. My dad said he only wanted to see them win before he died. I remember looking at one guy in this big, huge square of people all the way back there, looks like a mile. And I kind of just like a look at this one guy and like this, cheering, and yelling, and screaming, like, how and why would you do that to yourself? Black and orange everywhere, confetti on the ground. First time I've been on a street, didn't see the pavement. First time I'd look up, all I saw was confetti falling down. People cheering and dropping stuff down off the buildings. My teammates, the way they were so happy and smiling and watching them and how appreciative we are as a unit for the reception, for the, the fact that people did not stop believing. They called it torture, but torture never really did feel that good, right? That's something that is always going to be in my mind, in my heart, and uh, see all the fans out there, the energy. It was something very nice. It was, it was <laughs> incredible. I got emotional. I broke down a couple times. I had never been through anything like that, and I'm sure we'll never go through something like that again. But for the first time, you realize about the story franchise, and it's never happened here in San Francisco, and they showed it that day. It was a bit of a dream sequence. It was a tremendous recognition of how much a team and its players and all the fans can bond around a common theme. We go to City Hall, we do our gig, Wilson's epic speech. Kind of having a mini heart attack. I'm not sure what it's from. Maybe the electricity in the crowd. Maybe the smell of Prop 19. I'm not sure. It was awesome. We got to meet the Terminator. <laughs> you know, it's just it's just one of those things where, holy cow, it was it was quite the ride. It got out of the media with the whole thong deal, and I, I thought, you know, this would be a perfect time just to. Give the fans and everybody see, give it a give it a look, see see what the whole deal was about. I have a special talent just for you. From the rally thong to fear the beard, torture to pandemania. The 2010 Giants embodied team like few ever had. A unique kinship, powerful enough to last a lifetime. It'll be uh, something that I'll be able to tell my grandkids years from now, and I'll be able to look back and tell them about Buster Posey and What's to Come and Brian Wilson, all the great players on our team. It's pretty neat for me. It was such an amazing group of guys where we all just came together so well. Everybody was just so supportive of each other and, and we weren't dependent on one guy. That's a hard thing to have and it's something that management can't put together by looking at people. You never know until it happens. It's about relationships. I mean, you can have all the talent in the world, but the best thing you can do is, is communicate, be open and honest, get everybody to trust each other. And at the end of the day, knowing how long the season is, we finally realize what it takes to win 11 games. It's not a just one guy, two guys. We, you know, we're here, we don't think we got superstars. We always said that we are a team. When we thought we, you know, we played together, we stayed together, and that's how we're gonna survive, and that's how we, we thanks God, we, we won the World Series. Sort of built a chain where some guy would break the chain, another guy would close it, so it'd keep it together. And they kept the ball club together. They used to say, it's only a game, let's go. We get them tomorrow. What's so good about baseball, you can play again tomorrow. It's the team that allowed all these wonderful fans the right to stand up and say that we are world champions. Come on. They've been looking at the Dodgers win. They've been looking at the A's win. 
and they desperately wanted to take the dance and do the dance. And last year, they got to do the dance. And you know what? They danced pretty good. After 52 years without a title to call their own, that dance will play in the hearts and minds of Giants fans for generations to come. The 2010 San Francisco Giants. Legends now and forever. It's such an amazing feeling to be able to bring the first one to San Fran. And no matter what happens down the road, nobody's going to be able to take that from us. And, and it's such a cool opportunity to be able to share that with the fans. And that's something that we're going to cherish forever. It'll be a team that people will look back and think, wow, this is the, the new beginning of um, you know, the Giants. And hopefully between now and you know 50 years from now, there'll be more championships. But we uh, can always say that you know, we won the first one, and uh, that's the most special. We had a lot of skeletons in the closet, and now they're buried. But it's the truth. As an organization, we've been to the World Series and to the playoffs, and we've been, you know, this far away. And, uh, you know, 2010 team just finished it off and drove that stake in the ground. I spent 11 years of my career here as a Giant. And even when I was with other teams, you know, I always, you know, I played for other teams, but I always considered myself a Giant. I have a lot of pride in what they did, a lot of pride to say that, uh, you know, I watched them win a World Series. Our fans remember Mays, the Pubby, Cepeda, you know, our walking monuments, our living monuments. That's who they remember. And our fans are going to remember this group of guys like they remember those individual guys. All the history that, you know, is here with, you know, Willie Mays and, I mean, the list goes on uh, with all the great players. And they never got to experience that. And, you know, to see Willie um, come up to, you know, all of us and tell us, you know, how proud he is of us. There's nothing better than that. They're fans that have been there for a long time and have been following the team for a very long time, and you see what it's all about. You know, you see the fact that you know, there have been great players come through here, great teams that have come through the Giants organization in San Francisco and that came out on top, and, you know, it took us, you know, a whole bunch of different guys that are quirky and offbeat and eccentric to make it really happen. Baseball's a game, it's a family game. People are able to pass this game on from generation to generation. I've had several people tell me that a parent passed away a couple of years ago and would be so excited. I mean, it's more than just a game at that point. It's something that families can identify with and I think what's so cool about what we do. We carry with us 52 years of Giants baseball in San Francisco. And what happened this year was overcoming and creating a moment that 52 years of fans rooting for the team, 52 years of players playing, managers managing, coaches coaching, that's what this was about. It's really, really hard to explain how much this meant to baseball fans and the Giants fans in this area. I get asked all the time, just give me one word on the 2010 season. And a lot of times I just say it's relief. I don't have to worry about it anymore. They finally did it.